Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'd like to get started. I'd like to welcome you to the WWD and First Insight webinar, benchmarking your new product success rates against the industry. Our presenters today include Jim Shea, Chief Commercial Officer of First Insight, and Nathan Gray, Vice President of Planning and Allocation for Healthsburg Diamonds. Jim leads strategy, product management, and marketing and sales for First Insight. Nathan is a regional and executive leader with over 25 years experience. Throughout the webinar, please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A box on the bottom right of your screen, and we will discuss the questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Please mute your phones for the duration of the webinar, and now I will hand it over to Jim and Nathan to begin. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alexis, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. We appreciate you taking time out of the busy holiday season to join us for the webinar today. And uh, this is Jim Shea, and I'm here with uh, Nathan Gray. Um, I'd like to start out with this image here of uh, products on clearance, and I'm sure this is a familiar sight to probably all of you since uh, we're all involved in the retail industry to some degree, and most of us are in the fashion industry. And it's a familiar site, but it's an unwelcome site, and especially this time of year. Products on markdown, products at clearance, and a lot of new products, unfortunately, end up here on the clearance racks. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that behind every one of these products, uh, there was a buyer who thought the product was going to be a success, and uh, they committed the company to sometimes millions of dollars worth of inventory of the item. And so uh, this is not a uh, unique problem. In fact, Gartner is the uh, world's largest industry analysis firm, has said that one half of new product launches are deemed failures. And uh, there was an article in the Harvard Business Review that said about 75% of consumer packaged goods and retail products fail. So it's an uh, extremely large problem. Uh, MIT Sloan has said new, newly launched products suffer from high failure rates, often reaching 50% or greater. And companies like uh, fashion companies, jewelry companies, apparel companies, footwear companies spend, spend billions of dollars collectively developing new products and launching new products, and we have a greater than 50% failure rate. And the question is why? Why do new products fail? And in the fashion industry, clearly we have uh, fast-changing consumer preferences. Uh, we're trying to predict products because we have long product introduction cycles. We're dealing with Asia sourcing a lot of times. We have to make commitments to designs, to product selection, to our buys many months before those products are going to hit the stores. So we're trying to predict what consumers are going to want many months ahead of time. Uh, some, some particularly vertically integrated retailers will try store testing. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But ultimately, store testing is, uh, ends up being very inaccurate uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, typically the testing is performed out of season. So this time of year, uh, brands may be testing swimsuits uh, in anticipation of making the buys in time to hit the summer selling season. And not enough people are buying swimsuits in uh, December to get an accurate read on how well swimsuits are going to sell in the summertime. Uh, over and under pricing is clearly a challenge in the retail industry. We, we find historically somewhere between 10 and 11 percent of our products are underpriced. So whereas we have a lot of discussion, most of the discussion is around discounting and how the consumer has been trained only by when there's a discount. Uh, there are actually a percentage of products that are underpriced and could bear a higher price in the, in the market. And so getting the price right is clearly key to making a new product successful. Um, but ultimately, the main culprit, according to MIT Sloan, is that there's been a faulty understanding of customer needs. So there hasn't been enough connecting with the customer far enough in advance to understand what the customer wants and applying that information and that data uh, in a repeatable fashion to the new product decision-making process. So what we have found is that uh, at First Insight, uh, whereas Gartner and others have said that new product failure rates are, are 50 percent or so, we've actually found that new product success rates are less than 40 percent, meaning the failure rates are over 60 percent. 
And this is based on eight years of benchmark data that we've been running at First Insight uh, with retailers and brands worldwide. And I'm going to share a little bit of the data with you today. The, the, and please, as we go along, um, don't hold your questions till the end. If you have questions, type them into the uh, Q&A box there. We'll make sure we answer them. Uh, but the, the um, First Insight is a technology company that's been working with retailers and brands, helping them improve their new product success rates by testing products online for the last eight years. And so we have uh, a lot of data on new products and have determined that the success rates are, are believe it or not, less than 40%. And so I'm going to share a bit of the data with you here. Uh, we segmented it uh, North America versus Europe. And North America, the success rate a little bit higher than Europe, so 36% in North America versus a 33% success rate in Europe. Um, and then if we we have this data broken down into many product categories, we've aggregated it women's versus men's. This may not be a surprise, but the uh, success rate on women's lower than men's, 32% versus 37%. And the, uh, it's maybe not a surprise because women's fashions change very rapidly, uh, faster than men's, although the men's category is becoming much more dynamic these days. Uh, but in both cases, significantly less than a 40% success rate. We have the data broken down into many subcategories, but uh, take, just taking a sample look at a few here, uh, dresses, 34%, men's apparel, 38%. Uh, accessories, this is an aggregated accessories number of a number of different ex accessory subcategories, 32%. Women's footwear, uh, one of the lowest here, a 21% success rate. Uh, home goods, a 29%. So some of these are, are uh, even below 30% success rate. <clears throat> Just a, a little bit about First Insight and uh, how, we, how we collect the data and what we do. Uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're a technology company, and it's a service uh, that we offer to retailers and brands uh, worldwide. And they use our service to uh, improve new product success rates. And we work in four areas. Uh, we work in product design and selection, so upstream before uh, the buys are made. We work with designers to help them determine uh, what design attributes are going to resonate with customers. Uh, and, and what products should be selected. And then we work on initial pricing. So it's not uh, in season, you know, when do I take the next markdown based on sales velocity. It's all pre-season information. So what should the, the initial price point be before I take the product to market? And then uh, what would the AUR be, or average unit retail price, uh, what would I expect that to be for a product before I take it to market? So we actually forecast what the AUR is going to be, um, full season AUR, before that product has even been sold. Uh, buy depth, so we will forecast uh, what the right buy depth, buy quantity should be for a new product. And we do this based on looking at uh, price elasticities and percentages of demand that will occur uh, within each market at each price point. And then targeted marketing, so once a product has been designed, selected, priced, and bought, it will help the marketers determine how to take that product to market with the right messaging, how to target products to the right demographics, uh, psychographics, uh, so that the product, um, ultimately the right offers can be made to the right customers uh, for new products. And we do this with an online platform, and it's, uh, it's very fast, so there's a uh, level of speed here, 24 to 48 hours typically to get results scale. Uh, we're testing in some cases as much as 1,000 products a week for an individual customer, retailer. Uh, and then the science behind it. So there are a set of predictive analytic algorithms. We won't really get into that here on this call, but, uh, but there's a set of algorithms that help with the, the, uh, make the predictions um, as to how these new products will perform. And the way it works, it's a five-step process of brand, of the, the uh, merchants, the planners, the marketers, set their objective, what they want to accomplish with an insight. Could be, again, buy depth. It could be what product to select, how to target them. Uh, they select items. They'll upload images, descriptions, target price points into uh, our online dashboard. We actually help them do that. 
to our service. And then uh, we will reach out to the retailer or brand's customers through their CRM database. Uh, so it could be through an email campaign, it could be through Facebook or other online mechanisms and essentially engage consumers through an online game or a fun engagement. Uh, for 24 to 48 hours later, our analytics are applied to the data that, that come back through these consumer engagements and then we uh, will provide the insight or data out to the merchants, planners, and marketers through a login or uh, an actual mobile app that provides the information uh, to enable very fast decision-making on new products. So it's through this process that we've collected millions of data points over the last eight years on many different product categories. Uh, we provide rankings on which products will be successful. We provide price point, forecasts, and sentiment, all kinds of information. Um, and what, we're, what we've just launched in the last couple of weeks is uh, this benchmarking process that we're here today to talk about. It's called Foresight. And Foresight is a very quick process for brands and retailers to understand uh, where they stand in the industry. So as I mentioned, depending on the category, depending on the region of the world, different retailers and, and different brands can expect to see different success rate. So it's important for a company, a retailer, to know where they stand, quantify what their hit rates are. Many retailers don't really even know, and, and I think Nathan's going to talk about that a bit here, uh, they, don't, they don't really know what their hit rate is before they even get started. And more importantly, they, if they do know what it is, they, they don't really know where they stand against their industry peers. So that's what we'll do is we'll quantify what that hit rate is, we'll help them benchmark it against the industry peers, in their, in their categories and subcategories. And then we'll identify what improvement is possible through the application of the first insight process that I just described. And that entire process takes about three weeks. First insight has been, as I mentioned, working with retailers and brands over the last uh, eight years. So millions of data points on new products, uh, 30 plus categories across North America and Europe and we have extensive data on the actual hit rate improvements that we've been able to make possible through our analytic solution. And I'll just show you some examples. So um, this is the, the, what this would look like uh, if we were to engage with a retailer brand in terms of performing the foresight process. It is, let's say they were in four categories, women's bras, tops, dresses, and accessories. We would first put down what the industry averages are uh, in the reports that we would provide uh, through this foresight process. And the next step would be then to take a look at where they stand, so do a hit rate quantification as to where they currently stand. And in some category, we're going to take a look at where do they index. Do they index above or below the industry average? In this example, this particular brand uh, indexed low in uh, bras and dresses, but was indexing high on tops and accessories. And the next step is we would say based on our data set in these particular categories, where do we think we can get them from using the first insight process and what percentage improvement is possible. So we see anywhere from, you know, in the 50% range to 100% range, sometimes even higher uh, improvement rates in new product success rates. And so you can see the, the green bars represent the improvements possible through first insight in this, in this example. What we also do as part of this foresight process, benchmarking process, is we'll, we'll, take, we'll dive a level deeper. So we'll do an inventory analysis. Uh, we'll determine what percentage of inventory is dropping the t driving the top 80% of sales. So it could be 20%, it could be 30%. Typically, a relatively low percentage of the inventory is driving the top 80% of sales. Let's we'll take a look at where is their excess inventory? Uh, where is their uh, a margin loss due to having the excess inventory? and uh, we'll quantify that. And on the flip side of that, we'll take a look at where are their stockouts. So we see a significant percentage of time products sell through at a very high rate. The retailer or brand wish they'd bought more, they end up in a stockout situation, and we'll take a look at what's the financial impact of that. Uh, we'll take a look at uh, sample cost reduction opportunities. So uh, some retailers and brands are overdeveloping product uh, they may overdevelop uh, two to one, three to one. We've seen some retailers to overdevelop as much as four to one, meaning they're, they're building or uh, creating four samples for every one product that gets adopted in the marketplace. So we'll take a look at 
uh, based on best practices, how could that potentially be reduced? Because a lot of money gets tied up in samples. Uh, we'll take a look at where's the opportunity to reduce in-store testing costs, uh, reduce time to market uh, through reducing store testing. Uh, and that would be that, that last bullet there, product development cycle time reduction opportunity. So these all come as part of the, the foresight benchmarking process in, in about three weeks. And what does it take it, uh, to execute a foresight? It's, it's pretty quick and, uh, and relatively straightforward. It's just a data pull. So it's a data extract of anywhere from 12 to 24 months of data. Uh, it's by SKU, by category. Most retailers and brands have this data at their fingertips. Uh, particularly this time of year, they're looking at it day by day and sometimes uh, hour by hour. So um, sales units, margin uh, dollars, sales dollars or euros, of course, pounds, whatever the, the currency is, weeks of sales, store count, inventory. This is the data that we need in order to run the, the benchmark process. Uh, it just takes us a couple of weeks to run it once we have this data. Um, so that's it in terms of the, uh, the first insight foresight overview. Now I'm going to turn it over to Nathan Gray. Again, please feel free to type in your questions as we go along here. Make sure we answer them. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to Nathan and Nathan's uh, SVP of uh, Planning Allocation at Hellsburg Diamonds. Uh, they're a Berkshire Hathaway company. He's going to tell you more about his company and, and uh, how they leverage this benchmarking uh, process. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Jim. Appreciate it. So uh, a quick uh, look at our agenda. So what I'll do is uh, walk you through who we are as a company, Hellsburg Diamonds, a little bit about our business challenges and goals, um, how we're using benchmarking uh, and data analytics to increase our hit rate on new merchandise, and we'll walk through a little bit of the results. So Hellsburg Diamonds. We are one of the nation's largest retailers of fine jewelry. We operate 230 stores, uh, including 19 outlet stores. We're owned by Berkshire Hathaway Company, and we're based in Kansas City, Missouri. And this year, we are celebrating our 100th year in uh, operation, so we're, we're pretty excited about that around here. So a little bit about our business here. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, many different companies as well as different product classifications. Uh, for example, I've worked in footwear, home goods, ready-to-wear, and certainly jewelry definitely has some uh, nuances that uh, I'd like to talk about here. First of all, uh, we have three big selling seasons. create that emotional connection with the customer so that they buy it. Um, and with this uh, high cost and high retails, you, you also have a, a potentially a high cost of a mistake. So the margin difference uh, of one winning SKU versus a losing SKU could be as much as $225,000 depending on the category. So being more right than wrong is very, very critical in, uh, in our line of business. So in terms of some challenges and goals that we have, uh, number one is we really want to maximize our productivity per linear foot. We want to increase our inventory turns and sell through. We want to speed, uh, increase our speed to market on new items particularly. And we want to increase our batting average of picking winners. So with, with these, uh, these are our goals, I'd like to uh, illustrate for you the previous processes that we, would, that we went through in order to uh, select test items. So again, this is an illustration. And uh, you can visualize a, a vendor walking into our office and, and showing us a list, a tray of 10 items in there. It could be rings, 
pendants, whatever, what have you. And we, we would typically select three of those items at the store. Okay. We have a little bit of uh, background noise. I guess if you could please mute, mute your phone, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. So our process here, a uh, vendor shows us a, a, a tray with 10 items in it. Can't test everything, so we select three items to test. We select these three, put them in store, uh, test uh, two to three months in 25 stores, and typically we'll have one of those come out as a winner. So, you know, that begs, uh, begs a number of questions. Uh, the first question being, how many winners did we potentially leave behind in the trays? Not only the trays the vendor showed us, but the trays they didn't even bring. And two, and most importantly, how can we increase our batting average? Uh, so with these questions in mind, uh, this, was the, this was the big, um, uh, one of the big factors that we began working with uh, First Insight. So we began testing online with predictive analytics in quarter one of 2013. Our goals were uh, pretty straightforward. We wanted to reduce our store testing and accelerate our speed to market. We wanted to be able to pick more winners and reduce the dogs. So in other words, increase our overall batting average of uh, selecting winning items. We had the ability to modify designs to improve our product performance where appropriate. And also, there were opportunities to raise prices where possible based on the input that we received from our customers. So we ran a pilot. We tested 400, over 400 new items and products over two seasons. We measured the accuracy in, in picking our winners. So let me walk you through a little bit about the process and how it works. So number one, we create an online engagement with our customers. We send them an invitation or an email to a subset of our customer database. We collect these responses. They get filtered and weighted, and then we're able to review the results. So uh, let's walk through what that, uh, what that looks like. This is an actual example of an email that we would send to our customers, inviting them to share their opinions with us. Here, here is a, 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 a typical item that would come up on, uh, for the customer to review. And they title, they term this game, what would they pay? So we're, so we're asking for three pieces of information on each product that the customer sees. Uh, the first piece of information is, again, what would they pay? And there is a sliding scale here that allows them to settle on a dollar amount of what, of what again, what they think the average person would pay for this particular item. They also, there's also right below that a five-point scale on do they hate it versus do they love it. And again, it's, uh, that's the, the scale that they would choose. They're also able to uh, type in some free-form comments for us to uh, help get, give us, they, you know, these co comments give us a lot of insights as to how they feel about these products. And, you know, we, we're continually amazed sometimes at, at, at the wealth of feedback that, that we get from uh, any particular item. So here, so once, once all the data comes back, here is an example uh, of an output summary, okay? So in this particular insight, you can see that there were 12 items that the customers uh, evaluated. You can see the ranking or the, or the value score for each of the items. And 
Um, so it's all there for you, nice pictures, so it's all there for you in a nice clean summary. So as we go into a little more detail of the kind of information that you receive, uh, here is the uh, information for one particular item here. And you can see it's a white gold petite. The model price here is $4,000. And this is, you know, this is the value that these customers have, have uh, placed for this particular item. The other thing we look at is the sentiment. Okay, you have positive and negative, negative sentiment. For this particular ring, there's 47% positive sentiment. And what the software does is it captures the three, uh, three best or typical uh, comments um, from all the comments that were made and presents them to you. Uh, and you can see that it also has a 29% negative sentiment. And again, it brings back for you all the, the uh, top three comments that were made on the, uh, the, the negative side. And incidentally, you can review all of the sentiments, all of the comments that were made for each SKU. Uh, it's on a, a tab that you would have access to. And, and again, find that these comments are very, 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 very helpful. Uh, to help us evaluate the, uh, you know, how we believe the, the products are going to do. So what you're next presented with is the price elasticity curve. And again, this ties to the, the value uh, established on the previous page. You can see that here the model price is $4,000. And again, this is the average unit retail of what you of, of the item over the life of the uh, SKU. If we could just ask everybody just to make take a minute to please hit star six to mute your phones. We're still getting a fair amount of background noise. Star six, please. If you, everybody could do that and take a minute to do that. Thank you. So you may be uh, asking yourself, what's, what's behind the science to the value score and, and how, how does this all come together? So along with reviewing the test items that you're, that you're testing for, the customers are also presented with what we call reference items. And every insight has two, it's, it's, it's important that that two known strong performers are a part of the mix, as well as two known weak performers, okay? Uh, the algorithm qualifies and weighs all the relevant responses based on the customer's ability to properly identify the reference items. So those customers, said a different way, those customers that identify and correctly value these reference items, they're given a heavier weight you know, it's essentially telling us, hey, these customers know this category, and so we want to really listen to what they have to say when they're uh, giving us feedback on all of these items. So where are the opportunities to leverage this data? So we can use this to identify products which can bear price increases or, or don't need to be promoted. We can also identify products which customers like but, but will not pay, bear the planned price, meaning, you know, the, the price that the customer has said that they would pay for it is lower than the, uh, what we had intended to uh, retail it at. And so, therefore, it will be important to make some uh, uh, design changes, re-engineer the, the, the SKU to lower the cost. We also use this to identify products which had negative sentiment but high value scores which performed well and vice versa. So these are all the areas that we use to really leverage the information that we, uh, that we get back. 
So let me uh, take a few minutes to walk you through some actual examples here. So this particular SKU is one of our one of our best sellers. Okay, it's a, it's an actual top performer. You can see that the value score that uh, came back was a nine, which is a very very high value score on a scale of of one to ten. And you can also see that. The customers valued this piece at $4,566, which is higher than what we plan to retail it at. So again, that's another very, very uh, positive uh, element that goes into the overall, the overall value score. Now, what's interesting here is you see that it's, uh, the positive sentiment is only 14%. The negative sentiment is 71%. So if we based our decisions just purely on sentiment, we, we wouldn't buy items like this, okay? But because of the fact that, that the value that the customers identified with this product was actually better than, than our retail, that is the big driver of how this SKU is, is going to perform versus just the overall sentiment of the item. Now, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to sell to everybody, but it's definitely going to be above average performer. So here's another example. This is an example of a, a product that, that did not perform very well. You can see here that the value score that came back was a four, which is a low and, and a recommended not buy. The key thing here is that the price that the customer valued this at. They valued this item at $3,945. We placed a retail value on this of about $6,500. So very, very big disparity in the, va the, the minds of the customers and, and how they value this product. If you look at the sentiment, they're actually, they like it. They like how the ring looks. They gave some very nice comments about it. Um, so very high positive sentiment, a low negative sentiment. And again, if we were going to base our buy decisions on pure sentiment, we'd have bought this and, and, and probably bought a lot of it. So one of the things, as I mentioned earlier, how do we leverage this data? One of the things we really try to understand here is in looking at the sentiment and, and, and trying to take the sentiment and look at this pricing and put that together to come up with, okay, they really like it, they just don't like, they don't want to pay that much for it. So in jewelry, it's a... Another unique thing about jewelry is we can build a ring that looks exactly like this. We can build it for $500. We can build it for $2,000. We can build a ring that looks like this that, that has a cost of $4,000. It all depends really on the quality and the size of the center stone and the surrounding stones. Okay. So really what this told us was customer really likes the look of it. If we can build it to about a $3,900 retail, then it would be successful. Okay, so when we get feedback like this, that's how we take it to try to, to really uh, re-engineer and make a SKU that, that, that's going to be a winner. So, so what have we learned here? Um, we've worked with First Insight to benchmark our new product success rate. We found there was a big opportunity to greatly improve our hit rates in the same range as First Insight's stated benchmark process. And First Insight has helped us to achieve this, resulting in greatly improved productivity. 
so, a higher batting average is certainly equal to more dollars in the register. And that's all I have, so thank you. Great, thank you Jim and Nathan. Um, just a few questions here. Um, one for Nathan, um, what have been your biggest learnings and challenges in implementing this technology? Sure. Some of the we had a lot of a lot of good learnings uh, when we when we first started this. Uh, the biggest learning is back to those reference items. It's it's critical that for every insight that's ran, and typically the insights are you know the customer is going to see 12 to 15 items. Um, it's critical that you identify two good items and two not or poor performing items. Um, that is first and foremost uh, the most the biggest learning that we had and very critical. Also it's important that the images that the customer sees are of very good quality, right? So you could have the best selling item, but if the if the customer if, if it's not a good image that they're looking at, then you know what, it's you're not going to get uh, good results here. It's also important that that the descriptions are, are very um, deep, as detailed as we can and accurate because, again, depending on the descriptions, as I mentioned earlier, you can you can build a build an item uh, with varying different costs. So it's going to be important for them to value it correctly. They need to know what's the weight of the center stone and certainly the weight of the overall piece that they're looking at. And finally, what we learned was that it's important to, when, when we're showing these items to customers, that they're grouped in meaningful price points. So in other words, we wouldn't want to show a customer a $1,000 ring compared to an $8,000 ring. That disparity is, is, is too far apart, so when we run these insights, we really try to keep price points uh, grouped together. So those have been the, 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 biggest, the biggest learnings that we've had. Okay. Thanks, Nathan. And for sure. Jim, how do you know the solution works? How do we know the solution works? Um, like what we do uh, with each of our retailer or brand customers uh, is in the beginning we benchmark, as I mentioned, where they were before getting started with us using the foresight process. And then we, we typically run a value assessment, uh, which is essentially what we'll do is test a set of products that are preparing to enter the market. And these are new products that uh, are just getting ready to be launched. We will run our analytics on those products before they hit the market, provide our product rankings, as Nathan showed you there, our forecasted performance in terms of price, all the data that we would forecast in terms of performance on these new products. And those products would sell in for four to six weeks, and then we get the sales data after that period of time and uh, compare what actually happened in market to do. Had our first insight recommendations been followed, the gain in margin uh, is anywhere from 3 to 9 percent. And so as Nathan said when he talked about that pilot process with 400 products, they essentially ran the same right. type of process. Thank you. And for Nathan, how are you measuring the accuracy rate of First Insight for store testing? Oh, uh, yeah. So. I mean, I've talked about how we how we measure first insight, but when you compare that to um, when we compare that to how we measure the actual performance, we really look at five metrics for each SKU. We look at sales units, sales dollars, gross margin, inventory turns, and GMROI. So what we do is we as we assess, as we look at the performance of the um, of the of the actual SKUs that are in store, and we compare them to our average, 
So if the SKU beats the average of its category across these metrics, then we deem that to, to be a successful SKU. Um, and if First Insight accurate, accurately predicts a successful SKU, we count that as a hit. And we tally up the hits and misses and compare to uh, what we achieved in uh, how, we, how we did in our in-store testing. Got it. Thank you. And Jim, what is the size of the consumer pool that's used? Okay, so yeah, that, that really varies by category. Generally speaking, uh, we, we need a, a couple of hundred responses per product category uh, to get a statistically accurate and a, a predictive uh, set of data. Uh, so we don't need thousands and thousands of responses because it is predictive analytics as opposed to a survey. And, um, and so the other part is that, as Nathan showed you, the uh, consumer engagement that we use, we tend to get relatively high response rates, higher than typical email campaigns, let's say, uh, because it's something different. It's an invitation to the consumer that the retailer wants feedback, uh, they want the, the, the consumer to help shape the collection for next year. So it's involving the consumer in the process, and they like that, and they tend to respond at higher rates than, hey, buy today, you're going to get 30% off. Got it. And along that consumer vein, how can consumers know what styles will be successful in 12 months out? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the, the challenge is a lot of consumers don't know what's going to be successful 12 months out, uh, but some do. And the challenge for um, retailers is finding that subset in the population who do know and, and are predictive of what's going to happen. And as Nathan described, the use of these reference items, it's really filtering through the crowd. It's a crowdsourced testing solution that we have at First Insight. Uh, but it's applying some analytics to the crowd, and it's determining who are those, really, who are the great merchants out there in the crowd, those people who can, who can uh, predict on behalf of a much larger population on what the rest of the population will want. And that's, uh, that's what those reference items do. And, and they're capable of doing that 12 months out. We've had some customers have success as much as 15 to 18 months out. Okay, great. And Nathan, um, why do you think your store test